All right. Are you ready? I am. Test one, two. So use the mic for a bit. So okay. Gonna you got to turn it on because it isn't on yet. I yeah, so it's on, but he's... he's oh, okay, he's it, clever it's on. enough. He's it. clever enough to... Hello? Do you want me to move your bag for you, brother, guys? Oh. So it's nice and... Just so you feel... Mr. Ryan, would you like to have the... No, I'm fine. I can holler. Okay. <laughs> Use the beatboxing. Enjoy this moment. Yeah, yeah. Well. Thank you for this. Pull from the website. <laughs> yeah. Fun. The end's a little bit of humor. Yeah, so he um, he told me that that wasn't actually correct anymore, so I just crossed it out. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, we are nothing without you. As you receive our fascination from Galileo to Laudato Si, itself your gift, our interest, so enliven our minds. Open our hearts and sustain us with your love. You who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Ignatius. Saint Aloysius. All Jesuit martyrs. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. The talk we're about to listen to is from Brother Guy Consolmagno, director of the Vatican Observatory. Brother Consolmagno was born in 1952. He obtained his Bachelor of Science in 1974 and Master of Science in 1975 in Earth and Planetary Sciences from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and his PhD in Planetary Science from the University of Arizona in 1978. From 1978 to 1980, he lectured at the Harvard College Observatory. In 1983, he left MIT to join the US Peace Corps, where he served for two years in Kenya teaching physics and astronomy. In 1989, he joined the Society of Jesus, taking his vows as a Jesuit brother in 1991. On entry into the order, he was assigned as an astronomer to the Vatican Observatory. In addition to his continuing professional work in planetary science, he's also studied philosophy and theology. It is a great honor to have such a distinguished visitor to Stonyhurst, and we welcome you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm curious, is it possible to turn the lights down a bit? We've got pretty pictures. Anyone who invites an astronomer should have a chance to look at pretty pictures. So you've managed to turn off all the lights except the ones we want off, um, which is par for the course. That'll do. That's, I, I, could you, well, what the heck, we'll live. What I want to talk about 
It is. Oh, yes, definitely. Now you don't have to look at me. What I want to talk about is a bit of history of astronomy and more the history of how we as Christians have interacted with the physical universe. I start out with a 13th century student's notes. I don't know if you doodle in your notebook, but whoever the student was in the 13th century certainly doodled in theirs. In the medieval universities, in the medieval education system, there were three stages. The first were called the trivial courses, grammar, rhetoric, dialectic. Um, sometimes these are called what we still call grammar school. How do you learn how to express yourself? And I will mention, incidentally, if you're planning on being a scientist, the most important thing you can be learning right now isn't maths, isn't science, it's writing. You need to know how to write to get yourself into graduate school, to explain what it is you want to do, to get the grant money to do more, to explain what it is you have done. If you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. So be sure you know how to write. Then you get to the higher education where the four courses were arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. In other words, to get to know how the physical universe could be explored using the organ of the mind. And the organ of the mind is both rational and emotional. Only then were you allowed to go on to get your doctorate, and the things you would get your doctorate in would be either theology or philosophy. We're talking about, of course, the Middle Ages. Nowadays, the kind of high degrees you get are PhD, doctor of philosophy. It hasn't changed. In all these years, it hasn't changed. Why would people be interested in astronomy? In part, it was because of timekeeping. You may know that there's two different ways you can keep track of days. One is to make sure the seasons are right. If your culture grows crops, you want to know when to start growing crops again. Or what the phase of the moon was, which is important if you're fishermen or if you're hunting and you want to know when there's a full moon. And so we have in our own calendar moons, which we now call months, which used to be 29 days long or 28 days long, and there would then be an extra month that you'd have to throw in every three years in order for it to match the, uh, the year of the seasons. That's why the Jewish calendar still has this extra month. And in ancient Jewish times, the priests would wait to see the first glimpse of the new moon to say, all right, the month has started again. It's the kind of thing that anyone can see as long as you're not living in a country that's covered with clouds all the time. Julius Caesar changed the calendar that was wound up being used in the Roman Empire and through most of Europe and eventually most of the world. And they noticed a couple of things that had to be fixed. For instance, there are not the exact number of days in a year. It's not 365 days in a year. It's 365 and a quarter. But it's not even 365 and a quarter. It's 365 and a quarter and a little bit off from that, which makes a difference of less than one day per century. So you could just have a leap year every fourth year and no one would know the difference within a lifetime. But 1,500 years later, those days had added up to 10 days off. Gregory XIII, the pope in the 1500s, was instructed by the Council of Trent to fix the calendar, and he did that with a commission that came up with what we now call the Gregorian calendar. And I could talk about that for hours, but that's really getting off where I wanted to do. What also is happening around the time of Gregory XIII is the beginning of a new way of looking at the world. Certainly, the, uh, Columbus is uh, <clears throat> running into the new world, even though he had no idea what he was running into. And when he said he discovered it, the people who lived there were going, there. Yeah, that's news to us. Nonetheless, that created a big shift in the way we thought about the cosmology, the universe that we're in. And three things that I think are key 
before we can even get into the story of Galileo and Laudato Si, is this mentality, the, what we call the golden age mentality, the use of instruments, and the standard of proof. Let me run through each of those. I live in Rome now. I've got this American accent, even though I've got an Italian name. So it was you know, news for me to move to Rome. When you move to Rome, you see all of these old wrecks, uh, the Colosseum and uh, the, the, <clears throat> the uh, aqueducts, and all sorts of bits of stuff that are 2,000 years old. Now imagine that it's the year 1400. Rome is a dinky little village. Its glory is long past. There's a few thousand people who live there. And they look up and they see the ruins of what the empire had done so long ago that nobody can remember. What they're going to think is, boy, those guys were giants. We can't do anything like that. Things were so much better in the good old days. Furthermore, you talk to your grandma and your grandma's gonna say, oh, things were so much better in the good old days. Music was so, I can't imagine the music these kids are listening to today. That sense that the past was glorious and the present was going downhill is even found in the idea of you know, the Garden of Eden where everything was marvelous or the stories that Plato has of Atlantis. That was the mentality of the past. With the scientific revolution, the old idea that, ah, oh, knowledge has gradually faded with time, hold on to books, because books are a window to the past where they knew more things. Suddenly, Columbus is showing you a world that wasn't in any of the books. Suddenly, Galileo is showing you worlds that weren't in any of the books. And this, created a flip in how people thought. Rather than saying, oh, the old days were so much better and they were so much smarter than and the best we can do in the Renaissance is to create a silver age. By the 19th, 1900s, by the, you know, the, the 1800s, the 19th century, the flip became, ah, people in the past were so stupid and so ignorant, and we're so much better because we're gathering this knowledge step by step by step, and I'm so much smarter than my parents, and I'm so much smarter than my grandparents, and if I just wait long enough, all of this new stuff I'm learning is gonna replace all of that old. This is called Whigism. And especially in the 19th century, you know, the Victorian era, Electricity had just been invented. Steam engines had just been invented. My gosh, technology is going to replace religion. Who needs to worry about sin anymore because steam engines will save the day? Of course, the 20th century taught us a little bit different. And yet, this idea still holds in the imagination of a lot of people. Never mind that Nazi Germany had the world's most technologically advanced death camps. Technology is not a replacement for ethics. Technology by itself doesn't make things better or worse. An example of this kind of crazy thought is whenever you do see remarkable things that ancient people did, it wasn't really ancient people. It was aliens from outer space. Look at that. It must be a space ship. You know, come on, give me a break. But people are so in love with their ideas, whether it's the idea that the people in the past knew better, and therefore I refuse to believe anything new you're telling me, the old system, or people in the past were so stupid they couldn't possibly have done good things. I don't know. If you looked at modern architecture compared to architecture from 100 years ago or 200 years ago, I'm not sure that Whigism is a very good sense of uh, how the universe works. But this was a shift in the expectations that people have on how technology works, how the universe works, how things will... You guys are young. If the universe is always getting better, naturally, you don't have to do any work for it. You just wait for it, it's all going to happen to you. 
If that's the idea that you have, nothing good's going to happen. There is this interesting expectation about how the universe works. The old times, <clears throat> they thought of the universe as an organism. The most complicated thing they could see were animals. Imagine you, you, you're living in a house, you go on, you um, pick up the, the newspaper out Friday, that's like back in the days when people had newspapers delivered to your house. You go out in the morning, you're about to go to work, and there's a cat there. So you leave a bowl of milk out for the cat. And every day you're there, the cat's waiting for the bowl of milk. One day the cat doesn't show up, and you go, well, okay, cats are like that. The new way is to think of the universe like it's a complicated machine where everything follows cause and effect, like a string of dominoes that can be knocked over one by one by one. And if that's the way you think of the universe, then you're gonna say, where is the cat? Something must have happened. There must be a reason why, rather than cats are like that. That's the difference between thinking of the universe as an organism or thinking of the universe as a machine. The last thing that happened is that we need machines to look at the universe. In the old day, in the medieval times, the human eye was good enough, human senses were good enough. If you saw something, the person next to you should be able to see it too. Nowadays, I can see things only because I've got a big old telescope, and you don't have that telescope, so you'd better trust that I'm using the telescope correctly. And um, it has happened, radio telescopes like that, picking up very strange signals from space that other radio telescopes can't pick up. And it took a couple of years to discover that the very strange signals from space occurred every time somebody was downstairs from the telescope using the microwave oven to heat up a sandwich. But that means when you discover things and you're using an instrument that you don't totally understand, are you really seeing something or is it just a glitch in the instrument? That changes the way we think of how we look at the universe in ourselves. Now we get to the Galileo part. Who was Galileo? Galileo was the Brian Cox of his day. This is, you know, when he actually came to the Vatican Observatory. I've met this man, I can confirm that's his real hair. I met this guy who was an American popularizer named Carl Sagan. I will tell you that the popularizers are the way most of us learn about science when we're kids. That's how I learned about science. When you become a colleague of Carl Sagan, rather than a kid looking up at him, you realize he's just a guy like any other guy. And what's more, most of the other scientists who work with him have a very low opinion of him. Oh, he's just a popularizer, what does he know? Which is kind of unfair because this, these are the guys who bring in the next generation. Galileo was a popularizer. Galileo didn't have a degree from any university. He was a dropout. Galileo mostly made a name for himself by writing really marvelous books. And those marvelous books contain a lot of what has been the foundations of modern science, but there are biographers of Galileo who point out that he mostly learned that from his teachers who had been very bad at publicizing these ideas. What Galileo actually did, and this is no mean feat, Galileo was actually able to take these ideas and not only popularize them, this is the biography I was telling you about if you want to know more about Galileo, it's a, by a fellow named Hildrun. Galileo was able to take these ideas and synthesize them into a coherent picture of the world and then tell the next generation. Galileo wrote his books in Italian, not Latin. He wasn't speaking to the scholars who spoke Latin. He was speaking to the people around him. And his ideas, as a result, were able to get into the public imagination very quickly. 
Let's talk a little bit about Galileo, because he's a character that is well worth talking about. Born in 1543, or no, I'm sorry, he was, he was, he was the Copernicus. Copernicus's idea that the planets go around the sun, that came out in 43. Imagine you shift 400 years into the future. What was happening in 1943? Um, World War II. Okay. 1564, Galileo was born. Do you have anybody in your family who was born in 1964? I would have been 12 years old then. So, you know, somebody who's in their late 50s. Picture, you know, if Galileo were alive today, that's how old he would be. His first book about the telescope doesn't come out until 1610. Shift that again, 2010. So we're talking about somebody who had an idea about a telescope 12 years ago. He's had a whole career. He's been doing lots of other things before he builds himself a telescope. Why did Galileo build a telescope? Somebody told him how to do it. He didn't invent it. Telescopes require lenses. Lenses require glass. Good glass was hard to find. The best glass in the world in those days was in Venice, and that's where Galileo happened to live. He had access to good glass, and by building a telescope, he was then able to take it to the government of Venice and say, here's this telescope, which you can use for military purposes, and very cleverly, he didn't sell them the telescope. He gave it to them as a gift so that they would give him a lifetime job. Immediately, he started negotiating for a better lifetime job in, back in his hometown of uh, Florence, but that's a different story. Five years after his first telescope, that shows things going around Jupiter that he says completely supports the idea that the sun is at the center of the, of the universe, much less the solar system. There's great debates, theologically and philosophically. Most of you probably hear about the idea that, oh, oh my gosh, you know, this, this violated the Bible that said the Earth is the center of the universe. Number one, the Bible doesn't say that. Number two, the philosophy of the heliocentric, the, the, the geocentric system is not that the Earth was at the center, but at the bottom of the universe, as far away from God as you could get. All of the planets were better. The Earth was at the bottom. The only thing lower than the Earth is the inside of the Earth, which is the inferno, which is hell. So when Galileo says the Earth is not the bottom of the universe, He's actually promoting the Earth and making it better than people have thought about it before. He's called in by officials of the church who say, you know, be careful, this is upsetting people. But he gets a certificate from Cardinal Bellarmine, good Jesuit, saying, you're not a heretic. Don't let anybody say you're a heretic. The, uh, the, the people in Rome <clears throat> issue a statement in 1620 saying that, you know, that Copernicus book that came out 80 years earlier, we're now seeing maybe it's dangerous. If you have a copy of Copernicus's book, you must go in and cross out the line that says the Earth goes around the sun, and in the margin write, you can calculate positions of the stars by pretending the Earth goes around the sun. That was the censorship. That was it. We know where all of the copies of the Copernicus book that are, still exist. We've looked at them. An astronomer named Owen Gingrich has gone to every one of them. And he found that within the area around Rome, only half of the books were corrected this way. And outside of Rome, nobody bothered to do it. These are rules coming from Rome, and that Rome expects rules to be followed as much as Romans follow traffic lights. You know, come on. We've got a copy of the Copernicus book at the Vatican Observatory. It's not corrected. What happens if you push these things to the current day? That would be like something happening a couple of years ago. And it's a, you know, for somebody who was born in 64 of a book that came out back in World War II, 
And it's another 10 years from now before he actually is put on trial. How bizarre. Why was he put on trial after, you know, nearly 100 years after the Copernicus book was published and nobody cared? 20 years after Copernicus published his book and nobody cared? Interesting question. We'll get back to that. Remember what I said about the use of instruments. Galileo had a telescope, and this telescope allowed him to look at the stars and planets. But more interestingly, Galileo also had an education in writing and in art. Galileo was not the first guy to look at the moon through a telescope. This is the first sketch written by, done by an Englishman, Thomas Harriet. But Harriet, as you can see, was not the artist that Galileo was. Because Galileo's education included not only the sciences and mathematics, but also literature and also art. And he was able to communicate his ideas, a picture being worth a thousand words. You look at these pictures and you know you're looking at a sphere with light <clears throat> coming to the side. You look at that thing and you're looking at a dinner plate with a half-eaten, you know, fish and chips. Do I get my point across? You're getting your education now? Learn the arts. Learn the sciences. Learn the math. When you have all of these tools, you can do great things. I don't want to go too far into Galileo because I could tell the, you know, spend the entire talk. I'll point out three things that the typical history of Galileo kind of glosses over. First of all, Galileo was not a heretic. He was not a victim of the church who fled. He remained a good Catholic. Even after his unfair trial, his two daughters both became nuns. Of course, he never married their mom. He was an Italian Catholic, but we won't go there. The second thing, he was never convicted of heresy. This trial that comes up, comes up, you know, in 1633, and after the, you can read the transcript of the trial, it's available in English. It's not this big debate between science and faith. You read it, you find out that never comes up. And at the end of the trial, where the committee is about to vote, uh, they say, so we're going to vote on, are you a heretic? And Galileo goes up and said, nothing in the trial was about anything that was heresy. He was found guilty of vehement suspicion of heresy. He was guilty of being suspected of being a heretic. What a bizarre thing to be guilty of. Famously, he gets up before the court and he says, I abjure, I reject anything in my writing that is contrary to the church. And he never says what any of those things might be. So what does he actually confess to? Nothing. And they let him get away with it. At this point, you're kind of wondering, wait a minute. He was saying these things for 25 years and nobody had a problem with it. He was saying things that Copernicus had said for 100 years and nobody had any problem with it. He has this bizarre trial, which he then gets away with, you know, admitting nothing. Why in the world was he put on trial in the first place? And the answer is, we have no idea. <laughs> there are dozens of different theories ranging from a tragic conflict of world. Look, how can worldviews be tragic? I'm not quite sure of that one. Oh, he believed in atoms. Well, he, there's no reason to believe he believed in atoms. And besides, 100 years later, the guy who came up with the atomic theory was a Jesuit priest. He made too many uh, enemies, personal enemies. He was an Italian scientist. Of course he made personal enemies. That's how you roll there. The philosophers were out to get him. The Jesuits were out to get him. We only wish we had that kind of power. <laughs> his, pers his book personally insulted the Pope, except that his book had been approved by the Pope's personal censor before it even came out. He submits the book to the Pope censor. The Pope censor says, change these things. Galileo changes them. The book comes out. It becomes a bestseller. 
And then the Pope is shocked, shocked to find these things that are in the book that he must have already known about because the Pope and Galileo were good buddies. They talked together all the time. It's interesting that the book comes out at the height of the Thirty Years' War and there's all sorts of political pressures in the Pope and a lot of people think that the entire thing was a political thing. Whatever it was, it was not the church being anti-science. Um, if you want to know my idea about, you know, I've, I've written a book here called Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial? And the answer is, that's a stupid question. But among the other questions in the book is what happened to Galileo? And I blather on my co-author and I for 40 pages, and we don't have any better answers than that. So, you know, maybe you can go into history and do it right. It is important to remember also that Galileo didn't have the goods. At that time, knowing what they knew at that time, he was not able to prove that the earth was spinning. His proof that the earth was spinning was that look at the tides. No, the earth's spin doesn't create the tides. It's the gravity of the moon that creates the tides. Galileo says, that's why there's only one tide a day, except Galileo, there's two tides a day. And when in the early edition he said, and look, you know, friends of mine in Lisbon show, tell me there's only one tide a day, and somebody from Lisbon goes, writes and goes, no, there's two tides a day. He just crossed that part out. The other proof was, ah, if the earth is moving, you should be able to see stars shift in the sky one of these days that will happen. We'll see a bright star next to a dim star. The bright star is close to us. The dim star is far away. As the Earth moves, the relative positions of those stars will shift. And then I'll prove that I'm right. People weren't able to see that for another 400 or 300 years. It finally happened in the 19th century because the stars are so far away. Galileo could not see it. Incidentally, Galileo did discover that the middle star of what we Americans call the Big Dipper, you would call the plow, the handle of the plow, the middle star is actually a bright star and a dim star next to each other, which you can see in the telescope. Galileo discovered that. Galileo did not see any motion between the two stars. So like a typical scientist, he didn't bother to publish that because it went against his theory. But never mind. The other interesting thing to remember, of course, is that he was fighting this golden age mentality. He's discovering things that people hadn't seen before. He's creating new knowledge that weren't in the old books. He's using telescopes, which of course you then have to learn how to use a telescope, which makes it even harder. And he still thinks that he can prove the motions of the Earth and the planets, when really all you can do is show that it is a consistent explanation. And this is another point that scientists often forget. Uh, that's the beautiful telescope. Um, I'm basically going to skip over these things. The old philosophers used logic to prove things. Galileo thought he could use logic to prove things. Science doesn't prove. Science just explains what's going on. It just demonstrates things. This is a cool explanation which suggests maybe this the next thing might be true. But science describes it doesn't prove. And that's why science keeps changing. That's why you cannot use the same science books that your parents used when they were here because the science has changed, because we know that the stuff we thought we knew then was incomplete. Galileo had good probable arguments. He didn't have a mathematical proof, because they didn't know that that's you know, how, how science actually works. So at the end of the day, when we look at Galileo, was he a hero or a villain? He hated people who copied ideas, but most of his ideas he got from his teacher, a fellow named Sarpy. Yeah, right. He distrusted authority, but he said, you have to believe me because I know more about this than you do. And he distrusted authority 
because his father and his teachers taught him to distrust authority. Yeah, how does that work? You know, they, they, when I was in high school, somebody had a badge that said, question authority, and I go, question authority? Says who? <laughs> Just because somebody tells you to question authority, on their authority, you're supposed to question it. You can see the, the circular argument there. He was furious at his friends when they turned on him, but he did that when he left Venice, including leaving behind his mistress and his three kids, two of whom became nuns. You can build up a good argument that Galileo was not a nice guy until you realize he understood what he was seeing, he understood why it mattered, he understood how to explain this to people in a way that no one had done before. And we would not have the science we have without those talents. He knew that it was important to tell the world. There were other scientists arguing these points, but they were all doing it in Latin behind you know, ivy-covered walls. He knew that this mattered to the rest of the world. And his kids, who he abandoned, never abandoned him. They loved him dearly. There's a whole book of the letters that Galileo's daughter, the nun, wrote to him. His students thought he was a wonderful man and loved him dearly. And for all of his you know, furious and unfaithful friends, ultimately he went back to his hometown, which he was faithful to, and even after the highly unfair trial that he went through in, in 1633, he remained a faithful Catholic. He could have fled, he could have gone to the Protestant North. He didn't do that. Really, it wasn't Galileo so much as Newton's laws that made science work. It's not just the way things are organized, but that Newton could come up with a mathematical way of explaining why planets orbit the way they do. A mathematical way of going beyond what Aristotle had done. That was the revolution that made the Copernican system finally be accepted. And by the 1700s, when Newton was involved, we now have the Philosophical Transactions, the first book of scientific papers and you look, who's doing science in the 18th century, in the 1700s? This is a page, I just pulled at random, from 1735. I'm sorry, 1736. The first paper is by a medical doctor, MD. The second paper is by a minor nobleman. The third paper is by a German who's a fellow of the society. The fourth paper is by a captain describing what he's seen in the Hudson Bay. The next paper is by the Reverend de Falier, and the last paper is by another nobleman. Explorers, medical doctors, you could see why they would write up articles of what they've discovered. Noblemen and the clergy. They had the education and the free time to do the science. The idea that there was a, somehow, you know, the church forbade science, that's absurd. Churchmen were doing the science. It's only in the end of the Victorian area, at the 19th century, that the myth is created for a bunch of political reasons, just like the Galileo trial was for a bunch of political reasons, having nothing to do with science or religion. It's only at that time that people start wanting to bash on the church for being anti-science. Remember the Whigs? Remember the 19th century? Remember science is going to solve all of our problems? One of the problems science was going to solve was to make sure that inferior people were suppressed and superior people were bred. What does a superior person look like? Oddly enough, a superior person looks just like the people saying they were going to breed superior people. What a strange coincidence. They passed laws in America to keep people like my grandfather out of the country because they figured Italians were inferior people. The church objected. They were then said, oh, you guys must be anti-science. When you hear 
people ranting about how the church is anti-science. Remember the roots. The roots are in racism, the roots are in anti-immigration, the roots are in really, really, really bad science. Pope Leo, the end of the, uh, that time, establishes a Vatican observatory to show the world that actually, still look, look, look. We love science so much, we're gonna put our money where our mouth is, show the world we support science. And it's interesting to see what the different popes have said about science since then. Pius XI, when he built telescopes on his summer home in Castel Gandolfo, where I live now, writes, from no part of creation does there arise a more eloquent or a stronger invitation to prayer and to adoration. Astronomy has a role in religion because it inspires you to look at things bigger than yourself. But wait, there is more. Because the next pope, Pius XII, says not only does it inspire you to pray better, it actually brings you closer to the creator. Man ascends to God by climbing the ladder of the universe, he wrote. So science is important not only because it makes the church look good, not only because it makes you pray more, not only because in the physical universe you find God, but by the time you get to JP2, he writes that science can purify religion from error and superstition. Religion can purify science from idolatry and false absolutes. By the time of John Paul II, science is given a status equal to religion that, like, like a sibling, they're both ways of trying to come closer to the truth. Science is not the truth. Science is a root to the truth. Religion is not the truth. Religion is a root to the truth. There, there's an old uh, Jewish folktale, you know, loving the Torah more than God. Religion is an important technique, an important tool, an important society. It's a way of taking the knowledge that we got in the past and making sense of it with people who can explain it to you and then passing it on to your kids. That's why we've got a big organized religion for all of the pain that it can be at times. Science the same way. Everybody wants to be, you know, Doc Brown in your basement inventing a time machine, but it doesn't happen that way. Science occurs by teams of people who have learned at a university or a school like this, who can test their ideas with other people in a university or a school like this, and then who can pass it on to the next generation. Here I am, I'm, a, I'm an astronomer, I'm a planetary scientist working at the Vatican. I know firsthand what it's like to deal with a bureaucracy that can be big and cumbersome, sometimes run by idiots, and you wonder what the heck are they doing, and they're getting in their way all the time. Why do I put up with it? Because at the end of the day, NASA is the only outfit that was able to get us to the moon. Some people thinking I'm referring to different bureaucracies, but, but I meant NASA all along in that one. By the time you get to Pope Francis, you find something even newer in the relationship between church and science. The glory and honor of the psalmist, and we're talking about the psalmist who uh, is wondering, dear God, the universe is so big, I'm so small, and yet you've given me the glory and honor to be able to be recognized in this universe, Psalm 8. He says, the glory and honor of the psalmist is astronomy. Through us, this universe can become aware of itself and its maker. That's the gift. That's the responsibility given to us as rational beings in this cosmos. Notice the progression of the ideas. Science is good because it makes you pray. Science is good because it can lead you to God. Science is good because it makes the church look good. Science is good because it can strengthen our religion. Science is why we exist. 
why God has created rational beings. In you, the universe has become self-aware. And the fact that there's somebody next to you doing that is just the icing on the cake. And maybe in the far corners of the universe there's another planet full of uh, people who are also self-aware. Through this, the universe is able to know itself and know its creator. That's the center of the universe, not some planet. And that is the core behind Laudato Si. I'll just mention this is the, the building where I used to study at MIT, and there were professors there studying Venus, like Carl Sagan did, noting uh, <clears throat> how carbon dioxide makes a planet uh, atmosphere go through crazy things. The, uh, the first person actually to mention it was a fellow named John Tyndall, who was a, an Irish Protestant who hated Catholics. He opposed the Irish home rule because we don't want the Catholic minority under the dominion of the priestly horde. That would be an unspeakable crime. So this guy isn't always right, but he did explain the heat in the atmosphere in terms of the infrared absorption and recognized that carbon dioxide would do that. So climate change is not something that was invented 20 years ago. It's something that scientists have been talking about for nearly 200 years. Just nobody's been listening. It's something that I was hearing about when I was a student at MIT 50 years ago. It's just now we, we needed a Galileo to bring this to the public attention. What's more, Pope Francis's take on this is interesting because it's not a book about ecology. It's not a book about climate change because he points out that all the problems in our ec ecology are really symptoms of social problems, of economic problems, and those are not problems that institutions have. Those are problems that individuals running the institutions have. Ultimately, it comes back down to personal sin. Also, you can see in it that he's very Jesuit about it. This is the, uh, the, the, the <clears throat> principle and foundation found in the spiritual exercises. And it's about the relationship between a person and the physical universe. That our goal in our life is to come to know God in things and to properly use things because things were created by God. And guess what? We, too, ourselves are things. And the solution to the climate crisis is not a solution that you're going to find in the back of the book. It's rather a change in the way we think about these questions. To have ethics built into the way we decide to build our technology. To have more than just the invisible hand running our economy. In the 19th century, people claimed that, oh, evolution explains why I'm superior to you because I'm richer than you. It must have been you know, the, the hand of evolution. No, it was because you know, your ancestors were lucky or cheated or both. We need to recognize that economics is more than just what happens, but how we choose to make things happen. Ecology is more than just save the whales. You know, we are not the gods who can control the universe, nor is the universe a god that controls us. And I'll tell you, I don't know how many of you have had a chance to actually read Laudato Si. If you don't find something disturbing in that book, I don't care what your politics, I don't care how echo you think you are, if you don't find something there to make you go and stop and think twice, you haven't read it. In a deeper sense, we start with this relationship between science and faith. They say that Laudato Si is a bridge, but bridges only work when both sides are at the same level. We are creatures of the universe, subjects to its God laws and God's laws. Our problems, though they're technical, it's not just technical. 
They're not just technical problems with technical solutions. Got an answer, figured it out, move on. They're problems of good and evil, and good and evil is with us always. T.S. Eliot, the poet, uh, writes about the modern man, the modern human, constantly tries to escape from the darkness outside and within by dreaming of systems so perfect that no one will need to be good. Ah, if we just adopted my system, the problem would take care of itself. Ah, if we just did what I told you, then, then we would have no... That's not how human beings are. The man that is shall shadow the man that pretends to be. Let's go back to those fundamental shifts. That golden age mentality of the past. Or the idea that things are ever going to get better. Technology alone is not going to bring a golden age. We have to recognize that faith and reason together are constantly going to be trying to improve human beings. Technology, the instruments that we use to discover, can be used for good or evil. It's neutral. And science that uses reason, that tries to figure out what's going on, always exists within a human matrix, within human beings who are pulled towards good and evil. So let me end with another beautiful statement from Chesterton writing in Orthodoxy more than 100 years ago. Because ultimately the question is how do we relate to the physical universe? And Chesterton writes, the essence of pantheism, you know, the, 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 the Greek gods that were everywhere, the essence is, is that nature is our mother. But the whole point of Christianity is that nature is not our mother. Nature is our sister. Now, the people who worship the, 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 the pagan gods saw the, uh, nature as a solemn mother. But to St. Francis, who wrote the poem, Laudato Si, Nature is a sister, and even a younger sister, a little dancing sister, to be laughed at as well as loved. You don't dominate your sister. You're not afraid of your sister. You recognize that you and your sister are children of the same father. And though I don't have it in a, in a slide here, uh, which I meant to put in, but I forgot, the best relationship between human being and the universe might be expressed in the Hopkins poem, God's glory. Everything is smeared by man's toil, and yet there lives beneath it the dearest deep dawn things, as God in the bright morning breathes with our bright wings. Thank you all for listening to me. Oh, does sure. anyone got any inspiring questions for Brother Guy? We literally have five minutes before High Line. Anything. It has to be about uh, my work, about working for the Vatican, and, well, you know, what does the Pope have for breakfast? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Why did you choose to work for the Vatican and not for, like, NASA or something else? Good question. Great question. I used to work for NASA. I used to get paid by them. I decided to enter the Jesuits thinking that I would be teaching at a school like this or at a university. One of the vows you take as a Jesuit is obedience. They took a look at my record and ordered me to go to Rome. I had no choice about it. They ordered me to live in the Pope's palace, do research with a thousand meteorites, eat that terrible food, get to know the Pope. Under obedience, I had to do it. But I had no, no choice in the matter. Life is tough. <laughs> Good question. Anyone else?
When did the book come out? Which ah. one? Uh, the, the one that I was writing? Okay, my book called uh, Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial came out in 2014. And uh, if you don't remember that, just remember my last name. Go on to Amazon and buy every book that has my name on it. And you'll get the right one. Anything else before you go off to your next thing? What does the Pope have for breakfast? No idea. <laughs> Folks, I think you're... Okay, go on. Teach us. God, thank you, sir. Is uh, Galileo, like, your role model, like, you try to, like, be like him and live the life he lived, or is it, like, is there somebody else? Good question. Here are things about Galileo that are wonderful, things that you know, oh, why did you do that? We all have people the guy who inspired me was a professor I had at MIT. And the thing that inspired me was that he came into work every day having fun. Uh, we would have lunch, you know, all the people in his group would have lunch together and then play frisbee for half an hour before going back to work. If you're not having fun, you're missing out why you're doing this. At the end of the day, learning stuff is fun. Being able to build things is fun. God wants you to be happy. Didn't he ever tell you that? You know, we forget, forget what the Puritans are telling you. Some things that you think will make you happy won't in the long run. And, you know, the church never says, don't do that. The church says, don't do that. Because we've been there. We've done stupid things. But if you can find joy in what you're doing, then it never feels like work. For me, that's astronomy, but everybody's got to find it in their own place. What a wonderful place it's to end. Can we thank Brother Guy, please? I think you're now in the college. Not sure if this is still working. I think you're now in the college chapel, so as we normally do from here, can you lead out from the front, please? Thank you very much. Okay, off we go.